late, Roxanne, how late can we wait before we start the meeting without it becoming a, a cancellation? Is it like 11 minutes? Yeah, um, I mean, I, if people know that we're trying to get everybody up and started, I think we're okay. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. This time I'd like to call the order the Town of Ledger Town Council Community Relations Committee Public Informational Forum at uh, 6.36 p.m. on November 18th. Uh, this, this, is being, this uh, informational forum is being present, presented, as you can tell, from a, as a video conference. Presently, the basis of this uh, informational is a public informational forum to invite residents to participate in a conversation, engage in an exchange of meaningful ideas in regarding the social health of our community, town services, social injustice, and racial inequality. At this time, I'd like to recognize the fact that uh, Councilor Psalms is present, Councilor Ingalls is pre present. Hold on, I don't know what just happened. Am I still here? Yes, you're here. I have no idea where you guys went. Do you see me? No. No. Uh, no, but we can hear you. Okay. I'm going to see about getting back, going back in the meeting again. Okay. Uh, is, is, that being, is that being said? Okay, I'm back. I'm not touching anything. Uh, Councilor Soms is here. Councilor Ingalls is here. I'm trying to see, bear with me, because I'm trying not to lose my screen. A few of the other counselors are here. Councilor McGratton is also here. And I'm not sure who the users are. Uh, Ron also recognize, recognize that Rodney Butler is here from the Tribal Council. Uh, I won't go through the process of, of of listing everybody else, only because this is informational. And as soon as the chief is available to get on, we'll start the discussion. His plan is to talk about traffic safety and enforcement and use of radar. He's going to talk about uh, uh, the police department and, any, and interactions around the, the uh, spiritual center and also the use of radar on Shoeville Road. And at this time, we will have to hold for police Chief Rich, John Rich. Uh, one of the things is just kind of a formality. Uh, the process is, is Police Chief Rich will provide a presentation. At the end of the presentation, we will have a question and answer session. So if you have any questions, please write them down and hold them till the end. Uh, we want to make sure we get to the whole, the, his whole presentation first. Uh, this presentation is being recorded. So if there is a, uh, if you know somebody who wanted to see the present, wanted to be here but could not, or if you have, want to go back and review it, you can. Uh, if you have enough, if you have further questions after this informational that you want from the uh, to have addressed, uh, feel free to uh, reach out to the uh, community relations uh, committee meet on the town on the town council. Uh, we'll forward that information to uh, Police Chief Rich, and the reason for that process is so that we can kind of tr track the, the flow of information, uh, so we have an understanding for the committee on uh, what people's issues and concerns were uh, after hearing the inf having gone through the informational form. We Mr. Chairman, this is the uh, chief. Okay, oh, thank you. I'm not sure how well you can, how well you can hear me. Oh. <sighs> so at, at this time, I'd like to turn over the floor, the floor to uh, police, the alleged police chief uh, John Rich, uh, John, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. How, how is my uh, audio here? Because I'm I'm on uh, speakerphone. Unfortunately, was was not able to um, to make this to make the link work with the with video. So this is less than ideal. But I just want to make sure that you can all hear me before I start to talk about the subject matter that we um, want to present tonight. Very clear, Police Chief. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're very clear. Um, I, I'll just start by, um, and, and my, I know I, I sent uh, some slides to Roxanne earlier, and I, I'll, I'll work through those slides. Um, but uh, in the in the process of, of, discuss, of discussion, 
Can everyone see the slide? Yes. Okay. All right. So we're on slide one, um, Chief Rich. So you just let me know when to switch. I will. And thank you, Roxanne. Uh, obviously, this is less than ideal. We'll fight through it. Um, so in, um, in, in the formation of the committee here that, w that we're um, speaking with tonight, um, I, I had the opportunity a few weeks back to engage the committee in a discussion uh, to kind of find out exactly what it is that um, you think would be of the greatest interest in this conversation uh, as we go forward tonight. And some of the things that we landed on were um, traffic issues and enforcement in, in the town, um, as well as a selection of police officer candidates, and then policing special populations to include um, people with disabilities, the mentally ill, um, those with other similar challenges, memory challenges, et cetera, and um, wrap up with some questions. So that's my intention for tonight. So um, that would be on slide two, Roxanne, so if you want to just uh, go forward. And then in the, in the purpose of framing the conversation, uh, I, I understood from the intro that Chairman Butler is um, with us tonight as well. I want to thank him for uh, not only being here tonight, but also <clears throat> for um, years of collaboration and assistance um, as we work through um, matters of mutual interest. <clears throat> and um, he's, he's been a, um, a great help uh, on many occasions and also has uh, supported some initiatives by the police department. And we've tried to do the same um, for the, tri for the tribe and the tribal police. So I really appreciate that partnership and the fact that the chairman is here tonight. Um, earlier today spoke with uh, Acting Chief Potts, and I'm not sure if he's also in the room, but also wanted to recognize uh, his assistance on, on many issues, and I hope we've done the same for him. So uh, with that said, Roxanne, if you just change to uh, slide three, and yeah, um, in order to think I'm working. I'm working on it. It's kind of frozen. <laughs> okay. Not having okay. Questions, but I'll do my best. That's okay. That's okay. You let me know. Okay. It's it's. I'm trying to reload it again. Okay. So before we, um, hopefully the the visual will actually come up for you. But in order to frame the conversation again about, you know, what are the concerns of the community, the type of complaints that we get, and how do we um, you know, best serve our community as a police department? To that end, in 2018, just about two years ago, a little more than two years ago now, uh, we conducted a community satisfaction survey that was an online survey that went out via social media. And uh, we ended up getting, I believe, 288 responses uh, to the survey and basically 240 completed surveys um, with a variety of questions about how people feel about um, the safety in the community, how people feel, what people feel are the, the safety concerns of the community, um, crime in the community, traffic in the community, uh, quality of life issues in the community. And that was the, the, the focus of the survey. It was pretty lengthy. It was 54 or so questions. And slide three is just really a summary of the results um, that came back to us. So uh, from the respondents, we had an 85% positive uh, response about the trustworthiness of the Legend Police Department. Um, our response time to calls had an 86% positive response. Whether we treat everyone equally, 77% uh, positive response, and about a 13% neutral response in either did neither agree nor disagree on a five-point Likert scale. So um, whether the alleged police were respectful, we get an 84% positive response. Uh, whether we do a good job at community policing, meeting with community needs, we get an 86% positive response. As it relates to our communication with the community via traditional media, print media, social media, we get a 92% positive response. And overall satisfaction with the department, we get an 86% positive response. 
also informing us in the survey was um, part, part of the questioning was it as it relates to the level of fear in the community, fear of crime, fear of traffic crash, fear of uh, a number of things. And so basically, we ended up with a 30, 37% response of moderate or higher fear of crime. So 37% of respondents said they had a moderate fear of crime or higher. An example would be fear of a, of a burglary or break-in in your house, 38% moderate or higher level of fear. Fear of being involved in a traffic crash was at 56% positive response. Fear of actually being stopped and questioned by the police was at 10%, 10.5% positive. 67% of respondents believed that unsafe driving is a problem in the community. And at the end of the survey, we had 77 responses in a free comment section. Is there anything else you wish to add? And out of those 77 comments, 32 of those concerned traffic issues. Some people wanted more enforcement in certain areas. Some people wanted um, DUI checkpoints. Some people said passing in a no passing zone on various roads, including 214. Um, so, you know, more than one third of the responses, about 40% were actually about traffic. Uh, and they could have said anything. You know, some people said, you're doing a nice job. Some people said, um, you know, I'd like to see more uh, community interaction with the schools, but that type of stuff. Um, but I thought it was kind of probative that a good number of people were still talking about the traffic issues, which we know anecdotally as well that traffic and traffic crashes have been a problem in the town. So uh, traffic, traffic stops in general have been the subject of a lot of discussion in recent years here in Connecticut and nationwide as it relates to the illegality, um, the legality of any particular stop or um, whether or not a person feels that they've been stopped indiscriminately or they've been singled out, or they've been profiled. So I, I think it's important, I'll move to slide four and I hope Roxanne can follow. Um, I think it's important to state right now that in the state of Connecticut, under Connecticut General Statute 54-1M, that racial profiling is prohibited by Connecticut law and is a violation of civil rights. That police departments under that law have to have a policy prohibiting stopping persons based solely on race, color, ethnicity, age, gender, or sexual orientation. That uh, departments must record all traffic stop data, including date, time, location, um, reason for the stop, whether or not the person was searched, the uh, demographic information about the person, and all of that data gets forwarded electronically to the Office of Policy and Management for the State of Connecticut through Central Connecticut State University. They have the Institute for Municipal Policy and Research. So we communicate regularly with Central Connecticut State University uh, and the, the, the personnel there about anything that's required under the general statutes that has to be tracked by OPM. So um, departments have to have a standardized procedure for citizens to make complaints about if they believe that they've been unfairly targeted, stopped, profiled, whatever that might be. And the state generates a report each year uh, on the results of all of that traffic stop data. And the report's very, very lengthy. There are a lot of, a lot of statistical analysis. Some, some departments get um, named in um, for additional inquiry and additional review based on the statistics that come back regarding their traffic stops. And I also think it's important to note that Ledger Police Department has only been reporting this as an independent police department since 2016 because that's when we became an independent PD and I swore in as chief. And prior to that, Ledger's traffic stops were uh, under the guise or the, uh, under the umbrella of the Connecticut State Police. So 
since we've been mentioned uh, as an independent department and in the report, we've never been mentioned as having a statistical anomaly that required any additional inquiry or investigation. One, one thing that the report did mention of us, I believe the 2017 report, was the fact that aside from the Connecticut State Police, that Ledger PD was one, one of the highest proportional traffic stops related to speeding. And one of the reasons why we do speed enforcement um, is because speed is a, is a factor in many crashes and especially in injury, serious injury, and fatal crashes. So that's one of the reasons why there's a concentration on speed um, here. And all of our, all of our department vehicles, except for detective vehicles and unmarked vehicles are equipped with traffic radar, uh, bi-directional traffic radar. So the officers regularly monitor speed. Their activity is driven by data and past um, experience. And so if you can move to uh, slide number five, just wanted to make, if, if you can see that, and I'm not sure if you can, but the slide shows a, a heat map of um, injury crashes on, on Ledger's state highways, which would be Route 12, Route 214, Route 117, and Route 2. Um, notable that there are s several crashes, you know, we, and I'll go over the crash data in a little bit of how, the, how this is working, but there is a high concentration of injury crashes uh, in the area of Foxwoods. I, I've spoken to Chairman Butler about this um, in a meeting that we had back in September of 2019. And we, uh, we both talked, we talked about the, um, uh, several things, but one, one thing we talked about was one of the particular traffic lights there where there is a, a signal in the foreground and there's another traffic signal that you can see that controls traffic from, a, uh, from an off-ramp at the old lot eight. And that, that signal is also visible to the driver. It's in the distance and that there may be some confusion if one signal is green and one signal is red as to which one the operator emerging from that driveway or that entrance to the casino um, should, should obey. And we think that may be a factor in some of the crashes. And then I know the chairman and I had talked about it in both, I, I have contacted Connecticut DOT on that, on that situation um, on numerous occasions. So if you look at the heat map, and I'm not sure if you can see it again, there is a red spot which, can, which signifies the highest concentration of injury uh, crashes, and it's, it's right out there in front of Foxwoods, and it has, it's related to that, that phenomenon that we, that we see um, several uh, intersection crashes out there, um, and we're still working with DOT to try to uh, mitigate that. I know they talked about something with the traffic signals there, not necessarily the timing, but the actual structure of the signal and replacing the signals out there. So um, we do get a fair number of crashes um, on Foxwoods Boulevard, and we're, we're trying to work on that and mitigate that as well. So that's what that slide and illustration actually shows, um, along with other spots in town that we get um, more crashes, including right here in Ledger Center on 117 and 214. Some areas of Route 12, some of the intersections, particularly Route 12 and Long Cove Road, we do get injury crashes there. Um, so it's not just the area around the casino that we're concerned about. We have 40.6 uh, square miles of area to cover and we deploy our resources wherever they're needed. So, but the, the activity of the police is data-driven. I know, um, and I'll, I'll, dig I'll digress here a little bit to talk about um, more about the meeting that I had with the Chairman Butler on September, September 11th of 2019. And one of, the, one of the things, I asked for the meeting myself because um, there had been se several instances where um, Chief Dittman at the time had alerted me to an enforcement, enforcement activity being done from the driveway or in the area of 
the Mashantucket Tribal <laughs> Nation Spiritual Center, which is located at 938 Shuville Road. Um, and that that uh, area is our area to police um, the um, the road there, and the spiritual center is uh, policed by the tribal police. Um, my officers were using the the driveway um, really as a place to pull off and do speed enforcement. And after hearing about it a few times, I asked for I asked for a meeting with the chairman, and he obliged me, and, and we talked about it. And at the conclusion of the meeting. Um, you know, I heard him. I heard him loud and clear. He he, he basically he, he told me that there was concern, and that some some members of the tribal community believed that that was a either a targeting type of activity by the police. And um, I told him that, and, and he, he also let me know that um, that was their worship center. That's the church, and he felt it um, that. When I when I when I listened to him and heard him, um, I agreed that as a courtesy that we should um, refrain from using that area unless there's some kind of emergency for the reason why you have to pull in there or whatever um, that particular driveway. And I put that out to my people, um, and my understanding, my belief, since I haven't heard differently, is that that activity has been curtailed, it's, it's not happening anymore, and um, if it is, I'd like to um, hear more about that, but um, talking to uh, Acting Chief Potts today, my understanding is that it hasn't come to his attention uh, at all since he's been acting. So, um, so that brings us back to Shuville Road, and I, I did want to address that and get that out of the way because I know that's a concern, um, and has been a concern. So I'm moving on to slide six, and that actually shows in the past five years of injury or fatal crashes on Shuville Road itself. So talk, to talk a little bit about Shuville Road, um, many, many of you know, or the people who live in the area certainly know that um, Shuville Road originates on Route 2 in Preston and terminates uh, on, at Route 27 in Old Mystic. And it's a north-south thoroughfare between um, Route 2 and Old Mystic, and it's, it's um, heavily traveled um, at commuter hour. And a lot of people use it for um, recreation as well, some cycling and, and that type of activity. That um, we have had a lot of crashes on Chuba Road, um, some of them serious and fatal. and this map here only shows the ones that have injuries or fatalities. So if you look at locations, it's, it's about split pretty much even between the north section of Shuville, which is north of Iron Street and Indian Town Road, um, north of Route 214 running up to Preston, and then the south section of, Shu uh, I should say the middle section of Shuville, we call it the middle section that runs by the lakeside condominiums and down to Whitford Road and the farm. Um, so that's where the that's where the injury crashes uh, have happened historically, and unfortunately, again, like I said, two, since I've been chief, which is uh, over four years now, uh, we've had two fatal crashes on Shuville Road, and uh, that's one of the reasons why um, we conduct enforcement out there, along with other places in the town. So just to give you some of the uh, some of the uh, stats is that I just ran a quick snapshot from January 1st of last year until Halloween just a couple weeks ago, just so I could get a look. And there have been 27 crashes on Shuville Road in that period of time. And by comparison, um, 24 on Colonel Ledger Highway, 14 on Gallup Hill Road, uh, 10 on Pumpkin Hill Road. So those are the town maintained roads um, for that period of time, and those are the high numbers. Those are the only ones that are in double digits, and Shuvel Road, uh, I, again, had the most crashes uh, of, of any of the town maintained roads. So um, back, some of the councils will remember that back in 2016, and we actually applied for a grant uh, from the state of Connecticut through the Southeastern Connecticut Council of Governments to replace guardrails and signage 
out there. Um, and the, the town decided not, not necessarily to move forward with that based on the engineering costs that were associated, but that's where the original study uh, started uh, with the concerns, the concerns of Shoeville since I've been the chief. Um, and I, I was at both of those fatal crashes. Um, so this is the type of activity that we're trying to um, curtail as much as we, we can influence it. So within a few months of becoming chief, we started an accident reduction initiative in town um, based on, again, data, crash data and history. And it had kind of a, a three-fold um, approach education, and that, we do that in several different ways, including media, social media, uh, our schools, um, dialing our kids into where these things are happening. Um, engineering, again, that would have been the grant uh, to try to um, improve guardrails and signage out there. And then enforcement, which is obviously the police um, enforcing the speed limit or other, other hazardous moving violations out there that cause crashes. So um, that initiative wasn't just about Shoeville Road, but Shoeville Road obviously, again, was the highest town maintained road uh, for crashes when we did the original study, which was for the prior three years. Um, and it really wasn't that close. There were, at the time, in the three-year period, there had been 56 crashes on Shoeville, and uh, the, the next town maintained road highest was uh, Long Cove Road, which it had 39. So again, Shoeville was um, an area of greater concern. So some of the, uh, the, I'm moving on to slide seven now, uh, Roxanne, if you can follow. And so these are some of the results as it relates to um, total crashes uh, since we started this and I, um, when I, after I took over as chief. So in 2016, uh, if you averaging out the year, there were 294 crashes. I had to use an average of the, the 11 months after January because those 11 months were when the ledger police were actually responsible for all policing in town. We separated from the Connecticut State Police Resident Trooper Program on February 1st. So we didn't have accurate data and we went back uh, and tried to reconstruct it. So um, 294 in 2016 in th and three fatalities. In 2017, we had 277 crashes and two fatalities. In 2018, we had 266 crashes and zero fatalities. In 2019, 254 crashes and two fatalities. And so far in 2020, we've had 135 crashes, and some of that low number there is definitely related to the lack of activity due to the pandemic. So there were some, some months in there that we had um, single-digit crashes, and for me, on average, a good, a good month for us is if we have 20 or fewer crashes on average. So my hope uh, in in starting this was to get um, total crashes down around 240 crashes, um, and I thought that would have been a significant improvement. And um, this year, partially due to the pandemic and also due to the activities of the officers and other factors, um, a mild January, I think, uh, we've had um, 135 crashes. And, and so far this year, we've had two fatalities, unfortunately. Um, and we always hate to see those. Um, we sh one fatality is one too many as far as I'm concerned. Um, so that's, that's the information about um, the traffic, in, traffic control, traffic enforcement strategy in the town um, and some snapshot examples to give you an idea within the context of this meeting of what we're, we're trying to accomplish and, and how we're doing it. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, is it okay if I move on uh, now to the, the second um, informational item that we had, which was people are concerned in, in this day and age about 
who becomes a police officer and how we how we select them. So if if, if it's yes, go ahead. Uh, okay. So I'm moving on to slide eight. I know it's some small um, small print here, so I'll I'll go through it in the best I can. So the police officer selection process and the things that are required are all spelled out in both Connecticut General Statute 7-294A through E, as well as um, the regulations of the Police Officer Standards and Training Council, which is also covered under, that, under those statutes. So for those, of you, for those of you who aren't familiar, um, Connecticut has a robust tra training body, uh, an advisory body known as the Police Officer Standards and Training Council, um, that meets at the academy. The council uh, is um, a conglomerate of both uh, sworn police officers, um, college college professors, um, civilians who are interested. Um, it's it's a it's a it's a real kind of working group and a working body, and the council um, is responsible for the certification of police officers and also um, the, imp the development and implementation of statewide model policies that um, become the subject of, of legislation or the product of legislation, I should say. So when the legislature votes and says that we, um, we, need, you know, we need to have a statewide model policy on investigating missing persons um, and that gets signed into law, the Police Officer Standards and Training Council, for example, would be the body that is in charge of developing that policy. So um, it's a, compared to other states, it's a, it's a very robust and organized training system that is um, very specific about what's required of Connecticut police officers. So I'll go through some of the requirements as far as entry level. Um, the person has to be 21 years of age have a high school diploma or a GED and they have to be a U.S. citizen. They can't have any felony or class A, A or B misdemeanor convictions on their record. They can't have ever been convicted of an act of perjury or a false statement. They have to have a valid driver's license. When they start the selection process, it starts with a written exam. They have to pass a post-approved written exam we, we in Ledger and other departments around us use the Law Enforcement Council of Connecticut in Norwich as our testing body for uh, the written exam. After that, a candidate has to pass a physical fitness assessment. Having a forum hosted by the town council. Put yourself. Oh, thank you. Again, the, can, the candidate has to pass a written exam. Um, and then after passing a written exam, a list is generated of eligible candidates. And those candidates can test for any of the departments here in Eastern Connecticut after they finish uh, and pass that test. So our process after the written test starts with a physical fitness assessment. We just held one on Saturday for some openings that we have here. Uh, at Ledger High School. Uh, after the physical fitness assessment provided that the person passes, um, they're invited in for an oral interview. And if they pass the interview process, which includes at least one panel interview with our supervisory and uh, line staff, including our detectives, and then a chief's interview, if they pass that process and we deem them to be a valid candidate for the town of Ledger. Um, we give them a conditional offer of employment, and as part of the conditional offer of employment, they have to then pass a background investigation that includes a fingerprint-based background check. They have to pass a polygraph examination. Uh, it, we, we, we have it administered by the Connecticut State Police. They have to pass a psychological examination, which involves a questionnaire, standardized testing, and an interview, and then they also have to pass a drug screening for controlled substances that aren't prescribed to the candidate. Assuming that they pass all that, we have, would have already 
asked for and requested seats in the academy for the number that we need. We currently have two reserved for us for an academy that's starting in January. Um, the Post Academy is in Meriden, Connecticut. Some of it now is online, um, depending on what happens with COVID, can change a lot. But as of right now, the classroom and practicum involves 1,340 um, credit hours of uh, training. The person has to graduate and have met all of those requirements or have, and if they have any outstanding because they had an illness or something like that or an injury, they have to make them up. Um, and then the candidate begins 400 hours of field training at the department where they're hired. So our field training program is normally 10 working weeks. We can extend it as, as much as is needed, but under normal, normal circumstances, it has to be at least 400 hours. And officers ride, uh, candidates ride with field training officers, um, and then they um, eventually work their way through that system and through that protocol to the point where they're handling all the calls themselves with their field training officer basically observing. And as that progresses and they're evaluated on a daily basis, then um, eventually they can be released on their own as a police officer provided that they've passed all of those requirements. All the records are reviewed and as long as there's nothing outstanding, we send all of the information after they pass the field training program up to the police officer standards and, tr and training council and then that probationary officer would be certified as a Connecticut police officer. Once that officer is certified, the officer can then um, operate and act on their own under the supervision of a police supervisor here at the department. And after that process, they're on probation for a full year, which is a contractual, a contractual um, provision. Uh, between the town and the, the police union. So they have to pass a probationary period and then they are a fully certified and a permanent officer in the department. So the entire process takes uh, about two years for them to be fully certified and out of their own past probation. And then we as a department and the officer themselves are responsible for maintaining their certification which has to be re-upped every three years. Recertification involves training uh, and both in, internal training here at the department as well as external training with the Law Enforcement Council where our officers go through training with other officers from other departments, which is normally 40 hours, and it addresses whatever special topics are required. Uh, some of them change with with uh, different changes in the law and legislation. And I also think it's worth noting that um, since, since I've been here as chief and some of the processes that we've gone through, we've modified our process and we've um, recruited more widely um, to include, we have a handshake account that gets us in touch with 125 colleges and universities. And we've sent officers to recruiting events in uniform with information as far away as Housatonic Community College in Bridgeport. So we've made efforts and been successful in diversifying our workforce, both racially and ethically. And um, I'm, I'm proud of those efforts and there's more to come uh, in that regard. And at this point in time, it's particularly challenging because there is a re reduced, there's a reduced interest for people and actually um, wanting to become a police officer uh, in today's day and age. And that, that is, that is um, not just in the current climate environment, it's, it's been going on, uh, studied since 2013, um, and there's been a steady reduction in interest in law enforcement nationwide. Again, the police officer, the selection process is outlined in Connecticut General Statute 7-294A through E, and you can read more on that there if you're interested. Another topic that seems to have been of interest to a lot of people in town is um, 
policing special populations and persons with disabilities. And um, I've had requests from uh, Senior Citizen Center and Ledger Rotary and other organizations to talk about some of the non-traditional things that we do um, here in Ledger. And I was, as it relates to policing special populations, I just wanted to highlight really quickly our CIT program, which is our Crisis Intervention Team program. So for those of you who are not familiar, uh, CIT training has uh, been in effect since the 1980s, uh, started in Memphis, Tennessee under the Memphis model, um, where Memphis PD was um, being challenged with situations involving police interaction with persons in mental health crisis and at times it was resulting in use of force. They were trying to mitigate that. They came up with a program which involved uh, 40 hours of training as well as partnership with mental health professionals both in that training and on the street. I know there's been a lot of talk about that in the media in, uh, in recent months about um, mental health clinicians working with the police or working with the mentally ill instead of the police or some combination thereof. And we've had a CIT program in place since 2016, um, since I've been chief. And I know there are several other departments who do a great job with CIT as well. Um, I myself sit on the board of directors of the Connecticut Alliance to Benefit Law Enforcement, which is a nonprofit organization which conducts and provides that training. And we've been able to provide that training, or cable I should say, has been able to provide that training to 4,000 Connecticut police officers over the past 20 years or so. So CIT training is, again, post-certified. It's trauma-informed training. It centers on behavioral health issues and co-occurring disorders, including substance abuse, teaches officers how to navigate the mental health system and the crisis response system. It provides safety escalation strategies and geared towards slowing down emotionally charged crises. Um, there is a suicide assessment and prevention portion that's very significant in the training because some of the people that we deal with are in crisis and they are suicidal. And it involves uh, personal stories from people who have mental health challenges and lived experience both with police officers and, and also with their illness. So there is a really grassroots um, element to this where those people share the stories um, with, with the officers in training and the officers can benefit from their lived experience and also learn from the experiences of other officers um, who also have experience in the field. And the, the goal of CIT is to promote and strengthen crucial systemic partnerships between police and the mental health system. So how it works here in Ledger, now I'm moving on to slide, uh, slide 10. Um, it's a partnership between us and the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services, Southeastern Mental Health Authority, and we are, we are not the only department. There are several departments. I know Mashantucket Tribal Police Department has hosted CIT training in the past a couple of times. I've taught there. Um, and their officers are CIT trained and certified as well. Um, the Grottons, Stonington, Waterford, um, New London is where it actually started in Connecticut. Uh, those, those departments also have CIT trained officers. Under normal circumstances, and it's been a little bit of a challenge with COVID and staffing, but uh, Friday mornings, we normally get a visit from a clinician from the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services. He or she attends our roll call. Um, the officers become very familiar with the person, with the clinician. It becomes a partnership. They um, go over incidents where we've had people with mental health uh, challenges and crises over the past couple of weeks or from the last time the, the uh, CIT clinician visited. And then the officers and the clinician, the officer and the clinician set out as a team to go and follow up with people to see how they're doing, to see if they need additional services. 
And what that does uh, for us is really gives us a, a good pulse of what's happening with people who are having challenges, who are in crisis, and gives us an opportunity to um, give them better service. And again, it develops a relationship um, between the police and those citizens in the community as well. As part of our CIT program, we also have what we, what we call a special needs registry. So we have a mechanism, a system by which um, families in town who have loved ones that may have a behavioral health challenge, they may have a memory issue, it could be Alzheimer's or related dementia, it could be an acquired brain injury. Uh, some children on the autism spectrum sometimes can wander. So there are some families in town who have taken advantage of our special needs registry, and what they do is provide us with a lot of information on their loved one, including a picture, um, any special concerns, any medications, any any particular way that they end up that they de-escalate situations when when they escalate. Uh, if in the case of a memory issue, it could be uh, where the person, if they wanted before, where where have they been found? Where did they go? what type of vehicle they have access to, what medications they're on, who's the primary point of contact, um, those kind of things. So instead of getting the call and actually starting from, from ground zero, we're trying to gather information. In some cases, we already have the information in our systems. It's available at the officer's fingertips in their, in their car, on the computer, as well as a picture. And in the case of behavioral health challenges, um, the de-escalation strategy for that person is also included. So there are some people who have challenges who can be de-escalated or soothed in a number of different ways. It could be an object. It could be a blanket. It could be running the water in the faucet. It could be any number of things. Those are some I can think of off the top of my head that we have in our system. And so if there's a call at the residence where this person resides, the officer already knows uh, while they're on the way that the profile exists. And if, it, if the call involves that person, they have some information uh, that can help them try to uh, mitigate the call and provide service and come out with a successful outcome in the end. I know there are a lot of people who have children with special needs or kids on the autism spectrum that have concerns about uh, if and when they act out and what might happen if they have to call the police. And this is one way in our community that we try to um, help in advance of that. And I know that um, it's given some families in town uh, greater comfort that we actually have, have this service. And again, it's, a, it's an offshoot of our CIT program. O other things that we do, uh, and several the other police departments in Connecticut do, we have the green envelope, blue envelope programs for the hearing impaired or those with autis aut autism spectrum challenges that um, our drivers, and in those cases, um, the Connecticut Police Chiefs Association, Department of Motor Vehicles, other, other entities have gotten together and said, hey, if, if, they, uh, if the person were to present their paperwork to the police officer in, in this envelope, it will have information on the outside of the envelope to tell the police officer this person is hearing impaired and how to better communicate with them or this person's on the autism spectrum and what some of the challenges might be as it relates to an interaction with the police officer so there's no um, misunderstanding. And those are also here and available. I'll have to check our supply because I know we ended up giving several out. Um, and then just, just to close out on CIT that, you know, de-escalation is the common thread that runs through all that training uh, and that our officers get. And um, I know there's been a lot of talk about police officers and de-escalation techniques, um, and I know from uh, experience here that we've had several successes in de-escalation, including some uh, avoided tragedies where people are, are attempting suicide by cop, um, either by their actions or by even directly pointing an airsoft gun at one of my officers and he also was able to de-escalate the situation without any harm uh, to anyone. So that, um, that is CIT practice here in Ledger. 
So th those, those are the main issues I wanted to discuss. I, I wish I could actually see you all on video um, so we could have um, more meaningful interaction. But at this point in time, Mr. Chairman, that's the extent of the, of the information that I wanted to share. Um, that's what we had talked about, what we thought might be of pertinent information, and I'm happy to um, take any questions that anyone might have. Okay, thank you, Chief Rich, uh, very much for the presentation. Uh, before we start the question and answer, the question and answering portion of this, uh, I just want to make sure everybody understands that during the question phase, please continue to be respectful of everyone during, during this portion uh, to the to the people asking the questions per se, and particularly to the presenter, uh, Chief Rich. Uh, this is, as you're well aware, we're on an audio video process here, so uh, I'm not sure exactly the best way to see who has questions. Uh, I think there's a, poss there's a thing we can do. I don't think we can do a hands up on this one. So, Roxanne? Yeah, sometimes we've had people sign up in the chat. That would be great if you want to sign up in the chat to speak and Roxanne can uh, call you out. Do you have any questions for Police Chief Rich? Yes, I do. I, and I'm not sure how to sign up. Um, am Who's I getting through? Yes, this is Pat. And um, I want to say, thank Chief Rich for um, a good presentation. I just have one I have one question. Um, uh, Chief Rich, uh, since um, women make up 50 to 51 percent of the population in town, how many uh, female police officers do you have? Pat, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to say that we have none. There has not been a, a female police officer here in Ledger since 2011. The last one was under the resident trooper system, Officer Liz Smith. Um, we actively recruit uh, women. We've had only, we've had limited interest in um, women actually coming on the job here. Um, I don't know why that is, Pat, and I'm hoping in, in this next process, I know that we're moving forward with um, starting tomorrow after Saturday's, after Saturday, last Saturday's agility test, there are two women will be part of the process, will be testing. And so we'll, we'll see where it goes from there. I share your concern, Pat, about that, about that exact uh, topic. We end up, when we need a female officer for either a search or some other type of um, investigative assistance, um, we, we have to rely on our surrounding partners, Norwich Police, the Stonington Police, Groton Town Police, Groton City, um, are the, are the departments that generally help us out when we have a situation like that? I just noticed that when you were speaking, Chief Rich, and I don't mean to be too particular, but you mentioned uh, ethnicity <clears throat> and um, um, what was the other thing? Um, and never, not once did you mention um, gender. And that concerns me, but I am glad that that you're looking into it. What I um, Mont uh, Ledger, of course, has zero. Um, Montville has 15% uh, and Groton City has 16% female. Um, so I feel like we're kind of um, at a disadvantage. Um, and I, I hope that I'm glad to hear you say that you're you're trying to work that out. Uh, obviously, um, they're you know successful in in other towns, and so I hope that that will that that will be um, a priority. Thank you, thank you, Pat, for the input. I, I appreciate it, and you're 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 exactly right. Uh, Professor right. Gravener, next for questions. 
Chris, thank you very much for the presentation tonight. Um, so uh, my question is concerning the services that you um, uh, talked through that are offered to residents who have uh, various disabilities. Um, I'm a resident of 23 years of Ledger. I've served on the town council and I've served on the board of education. And I have to say that this presentation tonight is the first time that I'm hearing of many of these services that residents can sign up for to protect their um the their the members of their family who who have um certain issues that could cause um conflict with um uh, persons of authority so how do how do residents find out about these services yeah it's a it's a good point rebecca thank you um we so on calls for service directly on calls for service um officers point these things out, and, and as you can imagine, I, I know it's sensitive um, as to whether or not people want, people want to provide information to the police uh, to be placed in their system, so it's a personal choice. Um, we've also had discussions with uh, our superintendent um, as it relates to this um, special education population and um, my assistant Michelle, you know, ha has the forms at the ready as well. So she takes some inquiries and uh, sends them out. But if you, um, if you're suggesting that it should be more widely um, publicized, I I agree with you. Thank you. Uh, Marty and Pat are next. Uh, thank you very much, Roxanne. I think it was already answered uh, when Chief Rich addressed uh, Pat's question, uh, but it is surprising to me that slide eight did not include gender. Um, when, when one spoke of ethnicity and um, whatever the other word was on there, ethnicity and race, um, I was surprised to not see um, any mention of gender equity. So, I, so my question has been answered by Chief Rich when uh, Pat asked that question. Thanks. Next is Lauren Hippowitz. Hey. Lauren Hippowitz. Um, so I had a question regarding um, basically how you distributed the surveys and if um, when you were distributing them, did you pay attention to communities that were, um, you know, more ethnically diverse, like the Highlands versus Gales Ferry? Um, and then also if you were going to conduct another survey, you know, just given the light of um, everything, the climate, the social climate, I feel like it would be um, great to do another survey that's more recent and updated. Yeah, good point. So, at the time, uh, again, a couple of years back, uh, we sent it out uh, via social media, um, and so it wasn't a mailing or that type of thing. It was a um, a social media link to a Survey Monkey, um, and it's a good point, Lauren. I I agree with you. I, I mean, data. Uh, certainly can change um, and needs to be updated frequently. Departments um, generally who take part in these type of practices are usually aimed for every three years. Um, it's not something that's required. It was something that was of interest to me. Um, and that, that's the reason why we did it. So that's a good point. It's a point well taken. It should be updated and um, stay tuned for more. Yeah, I was also going to point out just um, that I feel that some of the questions should be elaborated on as well, such as like um, the fairness question or treating everybody equally, which was 77%, which is like, if it was a grade, that would be a C 
plus, which is not really, you know, up to par, but um, I feel like those questions should be elaborated on, um, you know, how are people tre being treated unequally or equally? I think the, um, the best way I can respond to that point you just made was just that the presentation tonight is a, really is a summary of what um, some of the things that we learned in the survey that's germane to the conversation tonight. And I, the, the questions are more detailed. Um, it, it was probably, like I said, 50 some odd questions. Um, so your, your point's well taken as far as how it, um, how it was answered, I guess. And it was a, a five point Likert scale. That would be, you know, strongly agree, agree, neither agree nor disagree, disagree or strongly disagree, that kind of thing. So um, the 77% represents the people who answered in the positive, either agree or strongly agree. And then the, the others were neutral or disagree. If that makes sense. Mike, I don't see anyone else signed up in the chat for questions for Chief Rich. Okay, then at this time I'm gonna ask anybody who's, who has a question to please sign up. Uh, the intention of this information was to have a presentation presented by Chief Rich, which I think he did an excellent job on. Uh, this is a, only an informational meeting at this point. Uh, if people have any questions in the, after we're done here and they want to uh, submit the questions, please do so to the Community Relations Committee and we will forward those off to Police Chief Rich. Uh, just as a side note, for those who may be interested, uh, the next meeting for the Community Relations Committee is on uh, December 2nd at 6.30. Uh, and I think at this point, uh, I'm going to, I think we've, uh, we've come to the end of this informational. And uh, I would see by consensus with uh, Councillor Sobs and Councillor Ingalls. Uh, Chief Rich, before we close out, do you have anything you want to add before we go? No, I just want to thank you for the opportunity um, and for the work that you're doing and f just for the ability to spend some time with you on really important issues for discussion. Thank you. Hey, Chairman, would you mind if I uh, just make one quick remark? Appreciate that, Chairman Butler. Yes, go ahead, Chairman Butler. Thank you. Appreciate that. I appreciate everyone's time this evening. I just wanted to um, just give a quick shout out to Chief Rich, and um, he, he really has done an amazing job in collaborating uh, with us and, and, and our needs in the, in the Pequot community. And as many of you know on this um, on this meeting, it hasn't always been the best of relationships, but they've certainly gotten better under his leadership and continuing to get better. We, um, we definitely uh, still have our speed bumps, uh, as we mentioned, uh, in that conversation back in September, ironically on September 11th, John, um, was, uh, you know, it, it wasn't entirely smooth, but at the end of the day, we, we heard each other out and, and understood where each other were, were coming from, and, and there were some adjustments that were made um, uh, immediately, and with a few bumps here and there, but we, we've ironed those out, and he's been incredibly responsive, and even even uh, recently when we had a tragedy uh, in our community, in, in our collective communities, because it happened in Ledger, but it was one of our young tribal members who had sadly passed away, you know, one of the first people that I heard from was Chief Ritz, and so um, it just speaks to the relationship and, and where we want to go moving forward despite uh, the, the, the checkered past. So um, still a lot of opportunity to improve upon, but we're on, we're on a good path, so I appreciate you, Chief. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and likewise, likewise, thank you. Just before we go, uh, Chief Rich, you had mentioned about a Mr. Potts. Is he the chief of police at the Tribal Council? At the, at the tribe? Yeah, uh, so Chief Chief Potts is on as well, and uh, also we have Councilor uh, Whipple, who is on, who is instrumental to, uh, the, to our two communities coming together. But yeah, uh, interim chief Potts is on, and I, I would like to point out, and I don't want to put any pressure on you, John, uh, but we have three female officers on, on our force. So uh, 
we're a few steps a few steps ahead of you and several minorities as well. So just say. That's, that okay. point is well taken, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. With that being said, uh, Councillor Ingalls and Councillor uh, Thoms, are there any questions? Any comments? Councillor Thoms, I, I just want to thank everyone for attending. Um, we had as many as 34 participants, maybe more right now, 31. So I'm I'm very grateful uh, to those people who helped pass the word and, and get the word out. So uh, well done, and thank you, everyone, for your time. This is Councillor Ingalls. Uh, Chief Rich, thank you for an informative presentation. Chairman Butler, thank you for being here. We really appreciate your presence and your support. Um, and and I, I echo Councillor Psalm's gratitude for um, robust participation from the community. Thank you, everyone. I, too, will echo, will echo the same thing. Uh, this has been really well uh, attended. And uh, thank you, everybody, for participation. And at this point, I would like to call the informational uh, over and uh, without with uh, without exception. Thank you all. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank you, Mike. Take care, everybody. Thank you.